Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning, depending on where you are located. Welcome and thanks for joining us today for our Seed World Strategy Webinar, Keeping Dust Off Out of the Fields and Out of the Headlines. Many of you know me as the editor of Seed World Media. My name is Julie Deering, and I'll be serving as your host today. To get things kicked off, I've got a few housekeeping items that I need to make you all aware of. For those of you on Facebook and Twitter, we will be actively posting using the hashtag strategy webinar. We'd like to encourage you to contribute to the conversation online, again, using hashtag strategy webinar. A special thank you to our sponsors, BASF and Syngenta, and a big thank you to our speakers for joining us today. We've got Amanda Verhelt of SGS with us, Justin Clark of BASF, and Bruno Sornin of Syngenta. So, so it's been a while since we've looked at seed treatment dust off. And as planting season is already underway in some parts of the United States and just around the corner for others, this topic is very timely. This year presents another opportunity for research and for farmers, seed companies, and dealers and equipment manufacturers to demonstrate ag stewardship at its best. A big part of ensuring seed treatment stewardship throughout the value chain means testing, and lots of it. That's why we are going to quickly review the benefits of seed treatments and examine how dust off is tested for, and getting into some detail. Then we will be, uh, begin our roundtable discussion with Amanda, Justin, and Bruno, to be followed by the Q&A session. Next slide, please. I'd like to make welcome Amanda Verhelst. Amanda first joined SGS in 2002 as an ELISA technologist. Through the years, she's earned a number of promotions and today serve, serves as research laboratory manager where she oversees contract research in the GLP division of SGS working. She earned a bachelor's degree in microbiology from South Dakota State University. Amanda, let's talk about seed treatments and testing for dust off. As Julie said, I'm Amanda Verhelst. I've been at SGS for a little over 15 years. Um, served in various roles here, starting in the ELISA lab, and I uh, now oversee our contract research, with, which involves all of our seed treatment testing. This is just a picture of our facility. We just moved into a new facility last summer, um, new state-of-the-art facility here in Brookings. Um, we have our, in, in addition to our contract research lab, we also have a standard seed testing lab where we do a lot of worm germ and vigor testing as well as purity and then we also have an analytical lab here on site um, where we do a lot of feed food and um, testing for compositional analysis and um, nutrient value. You want to flip slides? Um, so I'm going to start off this talk today talking a little bit about why we treat seeds, what the point of treating seeds are, um, different types of treatments that we use, and then we'll go in and talk about um, what is dust-off testing, how we do dust-off testing, and then we'll end with some of the environmental concerns um, from the dust off of seed treatments. Um, at this talk, most of the references are coming from the ESA, um, the European Standard for Physical Method Assessment of Free-Floating Dust and Abrasion Particles of Treated Seeds as a parameter for the quality of treated seeds. Um, this comes from the ESA STAT Dust Working Group version 1.0. Um, you can find that online. And then the dust reference values there are also found online at that, um, that link. And all of our methods here that we follow at SGS follow this ESA standard. So that will be where this information comes from today. Um, just to touch on some of the benefits of seed treatment um, as a background, um, as you all know, seed treatment is done to um, enhance seedling growth, um, enhance seedling emergence, protect the seeds or seedling from early insects or pests in the ground, um, enhance crop performance during the growing season, hopefully increase germination, and then protect from any seedborne or seedborne pathogens associated with other pests. Um, it could potentially delay germination depending on what type of seed treatment you're using and what you're looking for, um, and then Hopefully your seed treatments will assist in planting, making your planting more uniform by coating the seeds and making them more of a uniform size, um, and then also allow for safer handling of that seed. 
um, seed quality can be affected by fungi, inf fungi infection, insects feeding on the seed, um, if the seed coats are damaged, sometimes during storage there's mold growth that occurs or there could also be insect activity in that storage. Um, seed treatments are made to prevent or deter these effects from happening in seed and which, which should in turn improve seed quality. So now we'll talk about what dust-off testing is. Um, dust-off testing is an assessment of free-floating particles and abrasion particles of treated seed. It looks at the quality of the seed treatment, how it sticks to the seed, um, whether it flakes off, and it analyzes the amount of dust created by mechanically stressing the treated seeds. So the treated seeds should have a high resistance to abrasion and minimal dust loss. Um, the mechanically stressing is to set to mimic um, the activity that would occur during planting of seeds or handling them otherwise. Um, so we want to make sure that that seed does not lose that dust or lose that treatment back off of it. So this test will measure that. Flip slide. Um, so dust soft testing is run using a Hoibach dust meter. Um, in this meter, which is pictured below, um, seeds are placed into a rotating drum and mechanically stressed. So there's a bottle um, kind of pictured at the end of that dust meter down there. The seeds will go into that bottle um, and the, the meter will turn that and mechanically stress the seeds. A vacuum pump will create an airflow through the rotating drum and then there's a connected glass cylinder and attached filter unit. Um, we add a filter into that unit and dust particles are then transported through the drum um, out of the drum through the cylinder and, and will afflict, afflict to the filter unit. Um, and then, of course, non-floating particles are separated and collected in the cylinder, and the floating particles are what is deposited on the filter. So the amount of dust collected on the filter is determined then um, using weight measurements. So as you can see in these pictures here, the picture on the left is a filter of a sample um, that had very minimal dust collection, and then the filter on the right is a sample that had quite significant dust collection after the analysis was run. Um, the conditions for dust off testing are, are rather specific. Um, the samples must be kept, or the testing must be done, and the samples must be stored in an area separate from the treating area so you don't have any contamination from particles in the air. Um, the humidity and Temperature should be well regulated. Um, the humidity should be between 30 and 70 percent, and the temperature should be between 20 and 25 degrees Celsius. And these are to analyze the samples in. Um, you can apply more stringent conditions, um, but this is the baseline established by the ESA. You should have an area with no other free floating particles in it, no dust in the air, um, and then we will use analytical balances for measurements just to. Um, attain the level of accuracy that we're really trying to look for. Um, the amount of dust that we see hopefully isn't very much, so we are measuring very small particles or very small amounts. Um, so the seed conditions, once you receive or once you're ready to test the seed for dust off testing, that seed must be placed in a constant climate area um, at 20 degrees Celsius, plus or minus 2 degrees. And then um, we keep our seed at 50% humidity, plus or minus 10%. This is a little more stringent than the actual guidelines, um, but that way we're making sure we're staying within that range. Um, the seed must sit for 48 hours prior to testing to equilibrate to, that, to those conditions. Um, seeds are to be kept in paper bags to keep um, them as the same, easier, more easily kept at the same um, temperature and relative humidity as the surroundings. Um, and then you must determine the seed weight of the sample prior to, begin, prior to testing. Um, so we determine the thousand seed weight of a sample. Um, the actual procedure for dust off testing, we test 100 grams of seed. Uh, the seed, as we stated before, is placed into the metal drum of the Hoibach device and then the unit is reassembled. A glass filter fiber, or a glass fiber filter disc is placed into the filter unit. Um, the sample, the machine is started and the sample is run for 120 seconds. The rotation is 30 RPMs and the airflow rate is 20 liters per minute. Um, 
and then we typically run two replicates of each sample, and you clean the apparatus between each rep. Um, and then once we have that analysis run, we'll, we'll actually weigh the filter before we start the analysis, and then we'll weigh the filter after the analysis is complete. Um, as you see in this screen, this is the calculation to figure out the value of the dust on the seed. Um, so you need the weight of the loaded filter minus the weight of the filter prior to the analysis. So you're actually um, weighing the amount of dust that's on that filter that you've collected. And then you take that times 100 and divide by the weight of the treated seed. And this will give you the dust value in grams per 100 kilograms. You can also figure it um, in grams per 100,000 seed. So for our evaluation of dust off, we usually, as we stated before, run each sample as two replicates. Um, and we want to make sure the difference in those two measurements is less than 20%. If it's greater than 20% or greater than, um, if the result is greater than one gram per 100 kilograms, then we must we'll usually run another two replicates to make sure that, um, that nothing has been run out of tolerance. Um, then we calculate the final result as the mean of all four replicants. And as I stated before, these methods are based on European Seed Association, um, the Hoibach test. So these are just some of the dust off thresholds set by the ESA. Um, the United States currently does not have any official reference values. So to my knowledge, as of now, we, are always, we follow the European Seed Association values. Um, so for corn, 0.75 grams of dust per 100,000 seeds. For rapeseed or canola, 0.5 grams of dust per 700,000 seeds. For sugar beets, 0.25 grams of dust per 100,000 seeds. For sunflowers, 0.4 grams of dust per 75,000 seeds. Cereals is 4 grams of dust per 100, per 100 kilograms of seed. Carrots is 0.1 gram of dust per 100,000 seeds. Onions is 0.2 grams of dust per 100,000 seeds. And sweet corn is 0.75 grams of dust per 100,000 seeds. And then there's a few more on the next page here. Um, green beans, which is 0.2 grams of dust per 100,000 seeds. And peas, which is 0.1 gram of dust per 100,000 seeds. Um, and you'll notice there are some some types of seeds missing from this list too. Um, they do not have standard value or standard thresholds for those types of seeds that are that are not listed here. Um, so some of the environmental concerns uh, for dust off testing. Um, some of the concerns are the cost of material intended to remain on the seed that doesn't. So if you're um, applying material to a seed and that material is supposed to be useful for something and it's coming back off the seed because of the handling. Um, there's a cost there that you're not getting a return on. Um, products may not meet the required rates for effectiveness then if the product does not stay on the seed. Um, and then you also have a greater chance of resistance depending on what your product is. Um, but if you're not treating at the proper rate, you may, um, you may give the, um, you may give the, um, pests that you're trying to control a greater chance to become resistant to that treatment. Um, and then, of course, there's impacts of dust on the environment, which are may not all be known at this point. And then there's um, also a major concern with bees and other beneficial insects and what is happening to them due to the dust, and then also human health impacts that um, could be from the dust and the exposure to that dust in the field. Um, so that's really the overview of the basis of the dust off testing, I guess, and um, that's all I have for slides, so you can open it up for questions Great. or Thanks, Amanda. Um, discussion. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate you sharing that with us and uh, um, talking about the testing methods and the, uh, the different thresholds. So that's insightful to see that, you know, on a slide all compiled together. Um, now we're going to move into our roundtable discussion where Justin and Bruno will be joining us. I'm going to quickly introduce the two of them. 
Justin Clark is a technical market specialist with BASF Crop Protection. As a member of the technical marketing team, he supports field research efforts and manages technical positioning, training, and product use recommendations for BASF seed treatment and seed enhancement products, including stamina and stamina F3 cereal fungicide seed treatments, vault rhizobial inoculants, and other seed enhancement products. Justin began his career with Becker Underwood in 2009 in research and development, field development, with responsibilities covering cotton and peanuts. He earned a bachelor's in agriculture and a master's in entomology and plant pathology from the University of Tennessee. And then we also have Bruno, and Bruno has a background in agronomy and toxicology. He worked mainly in the regulatory area, area for 25 years. In 2005, he joined Syngenta in Basel, Switzerland in global regulatory insecticides and then built a regulatory team dedicated to seed treatment only. He has been involved in stewardship activities with the industry since 2010 with a focus on neonics. Okay, uh, now, uh, now we officially begin our roundtable discussion. So I've got a few questions here that I'd like to ask of uh, Amanda, Justin, and Bruno. Um, first, I kind of want to uh, better understand where we are today versus where we were 10 years ago uh, when seed treatment dust off you know, first became a major issue in headlines. Um, so, um, Bruno, I'll ask you to take this one since you've uh, been heavily involved in the stewardship side of things. If you were to evaluate the level of concern 10 years ago to where we are today and knowing what we know, where would you put us on a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being very, very concerned and 10 being not concerned at all? In fact, uh, everything started in, uh, in Europe mainly two countries, France, Germany, and a little bit uh, Italy and uh, Slovenia, and very little in uh, Austria. Outside of these countries, there was absolutely no concern, and this was back from the first time, it was in 2000, and then 2004, there was another small incident, and then Germany in 2008. After that, the um, European Commission, the political agenda was very high at the Parliament, so they tried to to escalate this uh, this dust. dust. Dust, dust, was the only matter. Outside of Europe, no one was really believing that there was an effect, and it's only later in uh, Canada and in uh, in the U.S. that. Four or five years ago, it started to have some uh, interest. And only two years ago, the Brazilian uh, officials start to be interested and are skeptical whether it could have an impact on their local species, local uh, bees or local insects, just to check. They are, they are wondering whether uh, dust has an impact in their environment. But outside of these countries, in Asia, no one is really concerned with dust. In uh, Australia, in Africa, no one is really concerned. So it's really focused on few areas in the world. And to tell you, uh, <laughs> to answer your question, whether I would rate it, uh, I would say it's still uh, high on the agenda in Europe because now they are even considering dust off to the water surface potential, but that's more uh, speculation. And outside of uh, Europe, US and Canada are looking at it and that's it. Okay. Would you, um, in terms of in terms of the concern, so there are, like you said, only a couple areas um, or countries, you know, that that have introduced regulations and where it is of high concern from an environmental standpoint. Um, 
even in those countries, do you think concern has lessened given some of the research and stewardship efforts that have been demonstrated, or do you think um, that has not made a difference? After the 2008 big incident that uh, occurred in Germany, a lot of stewardship uh, measures have been implemented, like these uh, deflectors or the apparatus or device that puts, push back the dust out of the vacuum uh, sewing machine, vacuum pneumatic sewing machine. Dust is directed towards the soil. Since then, in France, no incident has been recorded, despite uh, high scrutiny from the VET brigade investigating any uh, dead bee case. So in Germany, it was suspended, so it was not that critical, but no incidents were noticed. And in few places where we have doubt about the implementation of the stewardship measures, you could still notice it. And the, the only places where you could still find it, in the, it's in a very small-scale agriculture, where the plots are very small. People have a small uh, equipment. They are not rich enough to invest, to adapt, to follow the stewardship measures. And then in that case, you have some few um, remaining incidents. But it's really... Uh, maybe 10 per year under that maximum. And then this was okay. completely over after Thank you, Bruno. three or four and, years. And Justin, I'm going to ask that. My apologies. Uh, go ahead, Bruno. So after this uh, implementation were gradually fully implemented, then cases completely disappeared. And afterward, it's only rumors and uh, people propagating that uh, we have uh, read some publication, but it's dated. And then we had uh, some incidents in uh, Canada, but I think it's also very uh, related to the shape of the plot and the wind direction. So if you have not the, the right shape for your plot, and then uh, a small, uh, a little amount of dust can drift from the wind to something to outside of the field, that's where you increase your risk. But if you have very large plots, this is also an additional factor of dilution, which is not uh, integrated in the in the stewardship measures, but which is obviously the one of the dilution factors. Okay. I have and Justin, I'm going to ask the Do same you question to you. Yeah, yeah. I think that gives us a good a good overview of um, a, a good. It paints a good global picture of uh, um, of what's happened in the areas where um, dust off is of concern. And so, Justin, I was uh, going to ask the same question of you, um, and uh, you know, and I think specifically focused on the U.S., um, if you were to evaluate the level of concern 10 years ago to today and uh, um, the research that's gone in and stewardship um, kind of shepherding that's uh, uh, taken place, um, where would you put us on the scale of 1 to 10, 10 years ago and then today? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. First of all, thanks, Julie, Basically, for having me on today. Basically, I want to ask, have, have we moved the needle? Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I've, I really think that uh, we have moved the needle over the past 10 years. Number one, making everybody more aware of maybe what's going on, and I would say across the board for multiple stakeholders, right, whether that's the farmers on the ground, the seed companies, and the manufacturers of the products that go on seed, and then also even bringing in the equipment manufacturers, as Bruno made reference, to baffles and different equipment uh, alterations that they've done to, uh, to be able to limit the amount of uh, uh, off-site movement of dust-off, and also beekeepers, uh, 
uh, as well, and also seed dealers, and then also even bringing in government agencies, so everyone's kind of more aware. One of the partnerships that we've joined and become a part of over the past few years is with uh, uh, the Pollinator Partnership, and, and through that, they have a corn dust research consortium uh, that we've been a part of at, at BASF, uh, and they've done multiple years of studies uh, working with different components, whether that's equipment, whether that's seed lubricants, and also seed coatings, to really come up with a set of recommendations for the industry to address uh, the concerns for all involved stakeholders, whether that's extension, whether that's beekeepers, or whether that's farmers. So I would, I guess I would point everyone, at least within North America, uh, to uh, the pollinator.org website, just so everyone is, is aware of that organization. And some of the final reports have come out through some good quality in-field testing of, uh, and also uh, lab testing as well. Of, of equipment and also coding technology. Uh, that way everyone is more aware of that and, and what strides we've been making here within the U.S. So I would say it's much higher on the awareness uh, of what's going on uh, now versus 10 years ago. And uh, I would say our, our quality and, and uh, we've moved the needle forward on being able to reduce that, that dust off and uh, knowing some of the things that, that cause it more and have a better understanding of, of that uh, active ingredient retention. Great, thank you. And so, so, so dust, off, dust off is nothing new. Uh, you know, clearly, you know, Bruno says that they've been working with dust off since 2000 and, and here in the U.S. Um, that's kind of come into the headlines later. Um, but what specifically are your companies doing on the issue? And so, Justin, I know you said BASF joined the Pollinator Partnership and has been active in the Corn Dust Research Consortium. Um, what are some other things that BASF is doing? And, you know, has anything, have any new products come out of that research? Um, have, you, have you changed anything from a processes standpoint, and, and what does that look like? Yes, uh, certainly. Uh, if I sent in a, a slide, Julie, for reference. Uh, if you have the ability, if you could click maybe to that. I don't know if you have that ability. So it didn't uh, transition uh, completely. Uh, okay, yeah, I, I see it there. Uh, I apologize for the graphs. I guess they didn't uh, completely copy over. Uh, exactly, but uh, for all all of our listeners, I'll just bring to attention a lot of this, the things that Amanda was speaking about previously, the Hoibach dust meter that you see there in, in the photos. It's one of the measurements that we use internally uh, uh, to gauge the quality of coatings that we generate. Uh, now with major row crops, we use a lot of thin film coatings on crops like corn, soybeans, and cotton really to lock those active ingredients on, right? So that way we're, uh, it's acting as a binder and uh, preventing the abrasion, as Amanda touched on previously, uh, prevent that abrasion and, and dust off or rub off of that active ingredient. So it's got to cure down and it's, and it's got to uh, keep that active ingredient where it belongs because that's one of the things, right? A, a farmer uh, where he can get the most, uh, whether that's insect or disease control, he's got to retain more of that active ingredient on the seed because he, he's paid for it, right? So getting that benefit, that true benefit of that active ingredient for the farmer and also reducing any potential off-target movement. But one of the things that you'll see on the, on the right of the slide that I uh, provided uh, to Julie is the improved plantability and flowability because this is one way that we measure our success with some of our coating technology because we can create a great binding product but for a farmer it has to flow efficiently uh, and has to be able to be planted once it's put on that seed uh, so it has to have two unique properties one it has to uh, bind that active ingredient to the seed and not let it be abraded off but two it also has to have great flowability and plantability where you have less skips and less doubles in the planting process where a grower can be more efficient. Something like on corn, uh, you know, a skipped uh, plant or a seed can have direct 
effect on a grower's yield at the end of the day because it is so uh, stand uh, dependent. Uh, yeah, so we're working. Uh, one of the products that you may hear quite a bit about with MBASF is our line of flow route plantability polymers here within North America. So we have different polymers designed for different crops, right? So a soybean seed doesn't behave the same way as a corn seed once you treat it with a liquid treatment. So we've designed different products uh, to address dust off or active ingredient retention uh, for different crops. So for, in this example, our Flow Route 1197 and Flow Route 3330, you can see over time with our new developments with the graph on the bottom left, as we've created these new developments over time, we are generating products that uh, result in less and less dust off, and we're retaining more of that active ingredient for our customers and farmers. So 1197 and 3330, two products for corn, Another product we have is Flow Route 1706. That's for soybeans. So, and again, this is a, a, an area that we put a lot of resources into, and it's something we're really proud about. We've kind of been felt like we've been industry leaders over the past several years and been at the forefront of this dust off concern and developing products to address it for all involved stakeholders. Great, thanks, Justin. And uh, um, Bruno, I'd like to ask ask the same question of you, um, because I know this has also been an area that Syngenta has that uh, really focused on and, um, and, and been part of uh, um, some of the different partnerships and coalitions that are out there. Um, what has Syngenta learned um, through its research and, uh, um, you know, what's happening on the seed treatment side? Um, are we developing new products? Uh, Talk to me a little bit about, about what you're doing. In fact, we tried to provide to the customer, to, our, uh, to the seed companies treating the seeds, the best combination to match these uh, parameters about uh, plantability, flowability, but guaranteeing the lowest level of dust. So uh, in the US, you have this uh, premix that people, they love to mix uh, different combination of uh, seed treatment products, but among them, they have the, it's always a special combination, and we have to find the right match for the polymer, for the additive, to make all this uh, gluing and staying on the seeds without too much uh, dust off. So uh, a lot of our colleagues, of my colleagues are working on this fine tuning of the recipe of the of what is ex actually applied on the seeds to make sure that we match this um, dust of uh, limits and that's uh, sometimes not too difficult but everyone is adding a, a secret uh, powder a secret uh, booster and that's where uh, you need some help to make sure that it's still compatible with the dust of standards that we need to reach. So we are working a lot on this, and uh, we are always hoping that we could find uh, a better uh, coating agent. So in some part of the world, uh, authorities are uh, realistic, and uh, we have no too much problems to, to, to reach the standard. But there was a trend in Europe, for example, where they were uh, expecting us to reach such a level of um, no dust that we were um, trying to design a new sewing machine so that in the end there is no more dust available in, in, in the environment. Anything that we have uh, designed was quite expensive, and that's not a trend where uh, agriculture could go. We'll see if we have uh, something absolutely dust-free in the in the future, but we don't feel it's uh, it's possible. Just a tractor going through your your field is creating dust, so 
why would you be absolutely dust free while just walking in the, in the field create enough dust according to some officials to, to create some problems. So that's where we were checking the boundaries or the limits of this, uh, how much we can we uh, reduce the dust, what is the absolute limit. And then when we work in that direction, the Eubar method which is on limits. So we have to work in all these parameters now to, to try to, to do further progress. That's where we are working the most on. Oh, I think you made a great point, Bruno, in that just a, you know, mentioning that just a tractor moving through the field creates dust and um, and that that you can't eliminate dust. Uh, I don't think you know. No matter what you do, it's just uh, um, part of nature. Um, so so asking you know what are those absolute limits and in, in that threshold that would be realistic. Um, so I, I think that's very very good to point out. Uh, we did um, we did have a speaker. Uh, that was going to join us and talk to us from the Association of Equipment Manufacturers um, today, but um, unfortunately he had to uh, pull out at the last minute and uh, um, participate in jury duty, so um, our civic obligation and, and a, a great responsibility there. But anyways, um, I was hoping to get more into the equipment side of things and um, some of the changes that, um, in the partnerships that, that are um, happening. And so I know Nick is not with us to talk about that today. Um, Bruno and Justin, I don't know um, if you guys can talk a little bit more about the partnerships um, that you have in place uh, with any equipment manufacturers and what you've learned um, through those partnerships. Yeah, I was able to work. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Bruno. Oh, go. No, no, go ahead, Justin. Okay. Okay. Now, I was able to uh, be involved with a meeting uh, with a lot of the concern uh, in Ontario uh, with regulations coming down with more stringent regulations on using certain uh, insecticides uh, uh, for row crops. Uh, a few years ago, I was able to uh, work with the Canadian Sea Trade Association and really come together with a group of uh, industry members, uh, kind of unlike any other meeting I've been a part of, so different manufacturers of chemicals uh, and also seed producers and also had, had a tie-in with some equipment manufacturers as well, and everybody just had a come-together meeting and sit down, okay, how, how can we uh, help address this uh, potential issue out there and how can we all work together? Similar in the U.S., uh, previously in 2017, uh, back in the spring, we had a group from the EPA down to a field day, an EPA field day in uh, Maryland, and I was a actually able to meet Nick there from the Equipment Manufacturers Association. Uh, we had uh, some folks from the EPA down and people from different seed companies, uh, basic manufacturers like BSF and other folks, and also equipment manufacturers were able to talk to, uh, you know, the people that work in Washington you know, educate them uh, about really what goes on on a farm, uh, what the farmers are trying to do at every level to control uh, any potential uh, uh, dust off or uh, a similar type issue. And it was really amazing to see the level of detail that equipment manufacturers and also seed companies and uh, manufacturers like BSF really go to to address all the concerns. So we try to be as involved as possible and. and what I've really enjoyed is the education aspect of seeing what everybody's doing, working as just one industry uh, instead of everybody kind of being siloed, working on their own thing, kind of everyone's come together and, and bought in to get uh, to address this potential concern uh, as best they can. Thanks, Justin. Uh, Bruno, I'll let you go ahead and, and take take that on as well. So I can share the, what was the, um, the difficult part in the past, in fact, because this, um, the need to reduce the dust drift was coming from the 
active treatment uh, product uh, companies. And uh, at the beginning, the manufacturer of sewing machine, we are not much concerned. They say, it's your issue. <laughs> Please do a proper job. Afterwards, they are fully uh, understood that um, it's a uh, joint effort. And they supply new machinery, all equipped. And they start to sell uh, retrofit kits that could be uh, adapted to the older equipment. This is uh, easy when you have a high uh, renewal rate, like in the US, where what we discovered that all the 70% of uh, maize surface is um, with new equipment every year, planted with new equipment every year. So that's a huge amount, and once the U.S. manufacturer agreed to comply with this ISO norm, and I think it started all production of the John Deere, the case, all uh, sewing machines produced in the U.S. comply with this ISO norm on the 1st of January 2016, and uh, that was uh, astonishing to see how fast the implementation of such easy uh, measures could be implemented in, uh, in the US compared to some smaller countries where it's more difficult. Like in Hungary, we, we faced uh, hard work for four years and uh, we are not sure to have reached such a high level of uh, mitigation. Then to develop higher um, technology to move to uh, uh, almost a dust-free environment. Manufacturers always told us we need to have the exact uh, regulatory constraints. Are they uh, against very, very fine particles or is it more the coarse particles? Depending on the, the issue, they could select very good technology to address one or the other. They only mention that, for example, if they have to go like uh, the diesel particle filter, the cost would be almost one third of a sewing machine. So it's not what would be the preferred option, but it depends on the regulator. So it's a, a constant dialogue between regulatory agencies and, and the manufacturer. So they are ready. They have some uh, IP uh, in the drawer ready to, to push, ready to, to produce, they will adapt. And, uh, but they are not waiting only from us. They are right, really ahead of us. And uh, we collaborate at the beginning, many years. And then the more technical it, it comes, then we have to, to let them uh, do their, their work and gain their access to, to the market in, in a different way, one from another one. So the deflector, which was this single pipe that was put at the exhaust, is the first step. But to be more sophisticated, they, they, they will be creative. I'm, I'm confident. Great. Thank you, Bruno. I do have just a, a follow-up question for you before we need to um, move into our question and answer session. And so um, why, why do you think there's the discrepancy in adoption of equipment between, um, you mentioned, the U.S. and Hungary? Do you, do you have any speculation? The level of equipment. In Hungary, they have very, very old machinery. And uh, something like uh, $600 investment was perceived as uh, unbearable. So we have to find a way to subsidize such type of equipment. So we bought these retrofit kits and we provide them at a very, very reduced price. Even with this, it was still perceived as, uh, as difficult. While in the U.S., if you have something to adapt to your equipment, which costs uh, $100, no one would, uh, would say no. If it's mandatory by law, in one year, everyone has implemented it. 
Okay. It was more a level of um, how the farmers are, are rich or have a large farm. There is no problem. Small farm is always the problem. Yeah, yeah, certainly size can make a big difference there. Um, so let's go ahead and move into our question and answer session. Um, if you have any questions for Amanda, Justin, and Bruno, please go ahead and type those into the chat box at this time. I've got a couple that have come in here over the course of the last few minutes, so I'll go ahead and uh, begin to ask those. Um, the first one is, does the ESA dust off thresholds reflect treated seeds only? Um, does anyone analyze what's in the dust collected on the filter disk? And so Amanda, I'll let you tackle that question. Um, as far as I know, yes, the values are only for treated seed. It's measuring the amount of dust off of the treatment, not the amount of dust on the seed itself. Um, and we can do an analysis of what comes off of the filter. Um, we can do a verification using HPLC to see um, what type of treatment is coming back off, if your active is coming back off of the seed, or if it's just um, dust from the seed itself that you're getting on that filter. So we can, we can analyze that, yes. Great, thanks. Bruno, do you have anything to add there, uh, being in Europe and uh, uh, familiar with some of the ESA dust off thresholds? Yes, so uh, you may not notice because your sowing rate may be different in the US, but in Europe, all the units were quoted on a nectar basis. So they always think about amount of dust on the nectar basis, and you could see that everything is comparable except for cereals. Cereals are sown with a different equipment, so you could have a higher level. But that was the, the driving factor for setting this uh, reference. And there is a beauty uh, observed by the German officials. They have conducted some tests, and they have noticed that what is measured at the lab scale with this Eubar machine is very close to what you would collect in the first uh, meters next to the field. So it's a, almost a one-to-one -one relationship, and only the fine particles are collected on the dust filter in the Eubar machine. But if you uh, express this on the uh, you multiply these results on, with the sowing rate, so you have convert this on a, on a nectar basis. If you would have converted the small surface where you collect in the first five meters next to the field, also on a nectar basis, you would have a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. So this lab test is really relevant to predict how much will drift next to the field. Very good, thank you. Um, our next question comes from John Wells, and he asks, is there any progress in establishing a standard threshold, threshold for dust in soybeans? I'm not sure. Should I wait uh, if, uh, Please go ahead, yes. So in Europe, we don't have soybeans, so that's the reason why we haven't set any um, limit yet, or is a very minor crop only in uh, Italy. And we try to establish for um, legumes, so for peas, for beans, and we are wondering whether soya should be uh, comparable, but we haven't uh, completed uh, our work on this part. But generally, soya is a, a low dust crop compared to the other crops, so the, maybe it's not a priority compared to maize, to corn or uh, other crops. Thank you. Justin or Amanda, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just say, I guess none that I'm aware of at this point. Similar to Bruno's point, um, uh, soybeans typically are uh, a lower dust uh, type crop uh, as compared to something like corn, right? So I uh, typically don't that's not as much of a concern, uh, but I'm not aware of any uh, ongoing uh, thoughts to get uh, dust limits set on soybeans. 
Okay. And uh, uh, the next question is, what is the current status in Canada regarding dust-off issues? Um, Justin, I'll let you tackle that one first, and then Bruno, uh, if you want to come in and, and add to it, that'd be great. Maybe I should try my best Canadian accent. A, uh, I don't. I'm not uh, completely up on the Canadian regulations. I do know that most of the concern was based around Ontario, uh, and and maybe I think maybe I've heard some about uh, some concern around Quebec as well. But I, you know. Most of my time is spent within the, the U.S., so we, we hear about that quite a bit across the border and the extra measures that growers are having to get to to verify uh, that their pest levels within their fields at planting are at or above threshold levels to be able to get uh, a, a permit or uh, that type of process to be able to use uh, certain uh, insecticide chemistries but I'm not uh, completely up on that currently, but that's the, the last status that I, that I knew of that. Thanks, Justin. Bruno? So in um, Canada, uh, officials are more um, careful about dust. So they have a kind of a dust limit compared to the US. They are clear dust limit to match in, uh, and they are asking for, for the data. So it's not an audit, but you have to keep uh, samples and they could uh, check whether you what you produced is really according to to the standard so that's where they push and then for the deflectors for this dust reduction device on the sewing machine it's absolutely mandatory so it's more uh, higher concern and more attention Mm -hmm. Very much so. Amanda, do you have anything to add there? Are you familiar with what's happening there in Canada? Um, I'm not very familiar, no. So I don't have anything to add as I'm okay. not familiar with the. Sure. I might just add that our, our sister publication, Germination, um, has followed this issue pretty closely. And so I would just encourage you, if you are interested in learning more about that, to um, do a quick search of, you know, Crop Life Canada and uh, germination.ca. Um, our uh, other question that came in, is there much interest in determining the amount of active in the dust versus total dust? Amanda, do you, would, would that be best directed towards you? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, as of now, there is some interest in it. We don't have a lot of additional testing on the actives once we um, have completed the dust off testing. Um, we've had, done a few studies um, analyzing it, but at this point, it doesn't seem to be um, a real concern in the US, I would say. That's a great question. And it seems like it would be one maybe deserving of more attention. Justin and Bruno, do you have any other thoughts on that or um, anything to add there? In Europe, that's the trend. In fact, the officials have uh, turned, or that's the trend, huh? they have not finalized uh, the way they would like to assess the risk from dust, but they're always concerned about the active ingredient in the dust. But to measure it in a repeatable way, to avoid contamination of the equipment from one sample to the next one, it's, uh, it's an art. And uh, depending on where they want to, to land, how is the threshold that we have to reach, then uh, it's, for the time being, it's, um, we know that we can reach some uh, 100 milligrams of active ingredients per hectare, it's feasible. But sometimes we heard that they would like to have uh, below 1 uh, milligram of, uh, active, or below 0 0.1 milligram active ingredients per hectare. And that's uh, very hard to measure when you have only 100 grams of seeds. And then you have almost nothing left on your uh, filter in the oil bar test. So how to measure that in, in a 
reproducible way and how to arrange as a quality control uh, acting radiant in the dust, it's an uh, absolute nightmare. So for the time being, the whole uh, seed production is not prepared to reach this um, very, very low level if regulators are going in that direction. But that's really European slopes. Okay. Um, I've got time for two more questions, and we're bumping up against the one o'clock hour here, um, central time that is. What efforts are being taken by industry to educate and train seed treatment applicators and growers on dust mitigation stewardship? And so um, I'll uh, let Justin, or yeah, I'll let Justin uh, answer that first, and then followed by Bruno. Yeah, I think, uh, as previously mentioned, that Corn Dust Research Consortium, that's one way, you know, they've kind of got an outreach uh, through local uh, extension and state government uh, to educate growers and also uh, also to, to educate growers themselves with that pollinator partnership. Uh, internally, you know, that's one thing that, that we have a big concern on uh, and how we go out and educate our business reps and field reps and also technical uh, service reps throughout the U.S. So it, it is a big concern, especially as it, as it increases uh, in, uh, I guess, in regulatory pressure as more and more people hear about it. Growers are, are trying to stay ahead of the, themselves and, and trying to be educated. So we're working a lot, uh, kind of multi-pronged, to, to try to stay on top of this uh, ourselves. But yeah, we're, we've got a a uh, multi-pronged approach to it and, and uh, trying to educate growers the best that we can through several different ways. Thanks, Justin. And, and Bruno? So we have a very similar approach, but um, the pressure inside the company is quite, in Syngenta, is very high. You have to, if you have a new product uh, introduction in a, in a country, you have to present your um, stewardship plan and uh, you have a sign off from the higher management and they say please come back one year later and show us the result of your uh, proposed stewardship plan and most of the time we have to come with uh, samples taken uh, at random at the marketplace to check whether we comply with uh, a desk level and uh, we have to we better be uh, on the safe side to ensure that, we have to make sure that the seed treatment place are implementing the right uh, recipe. So we provide uh, services, we help them. We go at the beginning of the campaign, we do some uh, small uh, few batches to check that the, the tuning of their equipment and the recipe uh, are okay. And then afterwards, we take few samples to to make sure that it is uh, on the safe side. And then we always uh, explain, uh, raise the awareness with the farmers, please do the right things to prevent the dust going to outside of your field. So we have plenty of uh, communication uh, to reduce the risk to pollinators. And that's where what we do. Uh, Great, thanks, Bruno. And the, the last question for today is just the kind of looking at the future and say, you know, the next one to three years. And so um, I'd like to have each of you um, talk a little bit about um, just what, what your focus is going to be over the next one to three years and, um, you know, what, what steps you have um, are talking about or what we can expect coming down the pipeline. Um, that would um, help to make improvements in this area. And so, Amanda, I'm not sure if you guys have anything going on in the testing end in terms of new research or new testing methods or things to improve the current testing, um, but I'll let you take a first stab at that. Okay. Currently, we do not. Um, as long as the standard stays the same, our testing methods are staying the same, so we have no... Um, 
no upcoming changes to our protocols as of now. Okay. Good to know. And Justin? Yeah, I think uh, that's one of the things that uh, we always keep uh, an ear to the ground on, right, is trying to create new technologies, and, and we always try to keep moving towards a zero-dust product. Can we come up with a coating technology, you know, that greatly reduces uh, the dust off and retains more active ingredient than our previous version? We're all the time trying to come up with new generations uh, to address those concerns. So I think that's one of the things that you'll see over the next few years as we continue new generations of, of products. Uh, but over the past year or two, I've really been encouraged with a whole industry approach to this topic and how everyone is working together. So I think you'll probably see more uh, uh, groups working together in unison to come up and, and try to solve this answer uh, the best way possible, whether that's multiple things, whether it's equipment uh, alterations and new coding technologies, uh, in addition w with different seed company players too. So it's something I think it's a uh, uh, exciting horizon for us, how we can really answer this challenge and, and help growers uh, to be environmentally conscious as possible. Thank you. And Bruno? Just to build on uh, what Justin said, it's more, uh, yes, industry collaboration. And uh, for example, in Europe, we try to bring back some more realism. There, is no, there were no uh, incidents, massive incidents due to dust. And to um, reduce the concern from the officials because it's more in their minds than uh, in real. We try to have a more uh, modelization of uh, the, how the dust is moving uh, out of the field. And we are promising um, work done with some uh, universities. And we hope that this will get a better picture of what happens and uh, from one crop to the next crop, from one equipment to the another equipment, so we mesh it type we could describe what happens, and then once we have this, we will know how to interfere with the different parameters to maybe further reduce. So I hope that in uh, three to five years, we may gain uh, one order of magnitude um, to, uh, to reduce dust. Two orders of magnitude, hey, we need some uh, gap change, and I don't know how yet we can reach it. Okay, thank you. And um, that's it for today. I'd like to again thank our speakers, Amanda Verhelt, Justin Clark, and Bruno Sornan for joining us today and sharing their expertise. We hope that you found this information of, val of value. Again, thank you to BASF and Syngenta for their sponsorship of this strategy series. Also, please mark your calendars for our next strategy webinar to be held May 8th, again at noon central. We will be focusing on wireworms. Uh, registration is not yet open, but keep an eye out for that information to hit your mailbox as part of the Seed World Daily Newsletter. And as a note, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available on seedworld.com within 24 hours. That's it for today. Thanks again for joining us. This is Julie Deering signing off.